We don't have to wait around to plug into, you know, a more equitable world that's already out there for us to participate in. And there's lots of techniques that are already being shared for us to learn how to team up with other people in our lives and do that for ourselves. So it's, it's really exciting to me. Like I'm, I'm very optimistic right now, which is a nice feeling. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonserviummedium If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 17th episode of the show. In today's installment, I'll be chatting with a couple of thoughtful friends about useful and not so useful ways of practicing emancipatory politics. This conversation focuses heavily on the radical and practical potential of cooperatives and their relationship to anarchism. We also touch on a few new, fun, and interesting projects Nonservium Media plans to roll out this month. And be sure to stick around to the end of the conversation for a surprise interview with Frank Miroslav. For now, here's my conversation with Hakanto and Steven Leger. Stephen Leger is connecting with us from Austin, Texas. Stephen is one of my partners in crime who I work with on a pretty regular basis on non-serving media stuff. And uh, we've also worked on a few different direct action projects together in the past. And the other person I have on the line is a sharp guy who goes by the name of Hakanto. Hakanto is part of a group of uh, thoughtful folks I met a few years back who all live in the great city of Houston, Texas. Thank you all so much for coming on. Thanks, Joel. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. How are you kings doing? I'm doing all right. I'm uh, just chilling, enjoying the beautiful hot weather. Went for a nice bike ride earlier and then just came back and had a cold shower. And now with a beer in my hand, talking to some friends, I'm I'm feeling fine. Excellent. How about you, Steven? You know, I think my day was maybe... Um... Not quite as thoroughly enjoyable, but it was good. You know, just got wrapped up some work and just cracked open a brew with the boys. So it's all good. Excellent, excellent. Do you think Kings is more appropriate than, say, Comrades? I like Comrades uh, a little less than Kings, simply because Kings <laughs> is just so, like, Kings is just so whimsical. Comrades, com- Comrades ridiculously actually sounds a little bit more serious because we're, <laughs> we're obviously not Kings. So, <laughs> amen. Oh. I like to think about it, you know, every man and every woman is a king. <laughs> so how have you all been dealing with the whole coronavirus and social distancing thing going on so far? I would say that at this point, I've essentially processed that we are in a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, before, you know, like, you know, emotionally, that's like a rough thing to get into. And it's, it's been very complicated. And I'd say for now, I'm relatively comfortable with the situation. And I've kind of settled into, you know, both relaxing, taking care of myself, but also, you know, studying and enjoying some of the other things I do, like, work on music and do some cooking. So yeah, I've, I've found ways to make the most of it. Although it still is ultimately quite harrowing. Yeah, of course. How about you, Stephen? Yeah, it's all right. You know, I'm uh, fortunate enough to still have my job, my source of income. So that's been pretty nice. But you know, it'd be nice to it'd be nice to get out of the house once in a while. Um, I've been on lockdown since pretty much the beginning of February. I haven't been inside of a store for like what is that? February, uh, going on three months. Yeah. Wow, you haven't, you haven't gone to a store in three months? No. That's a long time. You know, I mean, I've been like the gas station and stuff, but yeah. Do you just have like a bunch of food piled up at home or something? You don't have to go for groceries or anything. No, not real. I mean, I, I did have a pretty good stock coming into the the whole pandemic issue, but I, I've been doing pickup at the at the stores. It's like three bucks more or something. 
Oh. Oh. Okay. Well, that's not bad. Yeah, though, no, that's a good idea. It totally is. Leger was also very. Leger was really keeping his eye on all of this as it developed, and I would say that out of most of the people that I know, including myself, Leger was the best prepared. He had the best foresight about this stuff coming up. So yeah, I've, I've got admiration for that preparedness. Oh, thanks. I can second that for sure. I mean, Leger reached out to me a couple times and was like, "Hey, this 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 shit is like coming," and I'm just like, "Man, like it's not even that bad. What are you talking about?" And then, uh, sure enough, you know, a week or two later, the the shelves are empty at our uh, local grocery store, and everyone started getting this thing. So, yeah, Leger was definitely right. Okay, Steven, let's go ahead and get right into this thing. I want to ask you some questions first, if you don't mind. A few months ago, you and I were talking about ways to expand the scope of what Nonservium does. And you had the idea of starting a new show that's a little more hands-on and maybe a little less theoretical than what I do with the Nonservium podcast. Why don't you tell the listeners what you plan to do and why you plan to do it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, um, and kind of backtracking a little bit back to that conversation we had, what, back in January, I suppose, was this idea that we've had non-Servium for oh man, five years or something now? Is that right? Yeah, close to that. I mean, I think that you did the first interview with Charles Johnson just about five years ago. That's right. Yeah, I think it was like 2015. So, you know, we've been around for a while and we have a lot of good stuff going for us. But something that we, we constantly talk about, I know we're going to get into with Kanto here in a little bit, is the kind of lack of delivery from a lot of anarchists and not just anarchists you know a lot of political radicals and and political minorities tend to get caught up into into this issue as well but a lot of high level thinking and a lot a lot of high level discourse goes on but that doesn't necessarily translate to real world results and i'm often left and i know i talked to to you and a couple of other folks about this as well i'm often left after listening to a lot of a lot of anarchist media with questions of, that's great, but how do I actually do it, right? That cake looks delicious, but what's the recipe? And so mm-hmm. I think the the idea that we had back in January was just to expand what we're doing as a media collective in the anarchist and, and kind of like radical milieu. And what I think we seek to do with this series or, or mini series is kind of get into more of the brass tacks of how things are actually done. How do you start a cooperative? How do you start a community garden? How do you start a community farm? How do you move towards building your, your own personal life in a way that is going to be something that's more resilient in this, in this kind of late capital economy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you comfortable with talking about maybe what you plan to go into on the first episode? Um, sure. I mean, yeah, I, I think I think we're going to kind of brush on a lot of those topics, especially the topics of the first episode um, today in our discussion, because Hakanto is on with us today. He's going to be a key player in the first episode of, uh, of this new experiment that we're doing. I think the idea of the first episode is to kind of set up the scene. You know, where are we? Where are we as just, you know, normal people? Where are we as anarchists in the world in this particular, you know, insane version of reality we found ourselves in? And what specific risks are posed by that reality to us, to our social institutions, to our families, those sorts of things? And once we kind of set the stage, I think the idea is to kind of talk about where we as anarchists and, you know, just people of the the more broad liberatory tradition Mm -hmm. kind of view the future of, of humanity. What's that positive conceptualization and how do we get there? And I know one of the main foundational issues to building a more resilient human infrastructure, more anarchist human infrastructure is definitely how we organize ourselves both in, you know, again, social institutions, business institutions, all of these things, how we organize ourselves within those and how we organize this constellation of institutions that make up our our society. Yeah, definitely. I'm really looking forward to uh, what you're going to do with that. And I'm also looking forward to uh, collaborating with you to try to help make it happen, too. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of folks are ready and they're thirsty and they want that sort of hands on explanation of how to build a house. I think we may have, you know, tapped the market out on uh, whether or not we should live in them. Right. Stephen, as I mentioned earlier, you've done interviews with non-Servium in the past before. You've conducted interviews in the past. In fact, 
you were the one who conducted the interview with Charles Johnson, which happens to be our, by far our most popular video on YouTube. Do you plan to take a similar approach stylistically with your interviews for the new show? I don't know. It's been so long since I've, I've listened to it, honestly. Um, I, I think one of the things that we were doing back then was in our interviews, we were cutting our, our, our questions out. We were cutting all of our speech out of the interviews, and it was just the answers from the, you know, the interviewees. And uh, that was pretty cool. But I think we're going to, I think it's probably going to stick to something a little more conversational. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be something, you know, with a little bit more back and forth, a little bit more um, ad lib, perhaps, you know, Charles definitely had everything together for that interview. And I had kind of taken some notes and, and everything, you know, not to say that this isn't going to be to be researched, but I think it's going to be a little more casual. All right. And um, Hakanto, one of the reasons I'm excited about this new show with Steven is um, because it's going to, again, it's going to focus on more of the practical competitive advantages of building a more free world as opposed to mere antagonism, mm -hmm. right? And I frame it that way because in a group chat, you sort of helped me put words to a sentiment within anarchist philosophy that wasn't always very easily articulable. And that's the concept of competition versus antagonism. Can you please go into what that means and why you sort of choose to frame it in that way? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that this concept gets framed. People talk about things like dual power or, you know, we need to build a new world and the shell of the old. And often those metaphors are a little bit, they can even be a little bit dark and dreary. People are very, very used to, and I think comfortable with the idea of, you know, just providing an alternative, a competing product, a competing business. You know, everybody sees that all the time around them. If we've got something like anarchism, you know, which is like a series of, it's like a collection of ideas. It's a collection of beliefs. You know, I kind of take a step back and I wonder what is it providing for people like on an everyday basis? If you say, Hey, I, I agree with all these ideas. I guess I am an anarchist or a socialist or a capitalist or whatever it is just by agreeing with the ideas. You know, it's like, what is it? What is that system of ideas providing for you? Mm -hmm. And people can see all around them including us, like I include us in those people. We see all around us the th things that capitalism provides for us. And we're very used to how it works. We've got a lot of practice with it. We know what it's like to be in a job. We know what it's like to, you know, pay our, our bills. We know what it's like to get wages. And those are like nearly universal experiences at this point. So something I've just noticed throughout my time of you know, trying to study lots of different political views and different political perspectives or economic perspectives is that they often get themselves stuck in a rut where they are simply critiquing what exists. Mm -hmm. They're saying everybody's very familiar with what exists, but we want to tell you more explicitly like what's bad about it. We want you to <laughs> really, really understand just how bad it is. Like it's so much worse than you thought, even though most people aren't really fans of the world as it exists. Like I think most most people are like passionately pursuing their goals, their dreams. They're taking care of themselves and the people they care about. They are taking care of their communities the ways that they have experience with. And if anything, they're just looking for other ways to practice living out those dreams. They're to practice caring for each other, to practice providing good jobs and work. And they're they're looking for ways to practice that. Mm -hmm. So an antagonism for me versus competition, antagonism is just this, this entire realm of thought where it's it's kind of like saying, you know, baseball is bad. I hate baseball. This is why you should hate baseball. And then just kind of like leaving it at that. But you're not really providing another sport. Mm -hmm. You're not really acknowledging the reality that people want to play like people want to watch a game. It's kind of denying the entire like foundation of what's even driving that in the first place whereas what what theorists could be focusing on is they could be focusing on like what is a new game that we could play together that is better and even more importantly how can we practice that game together we talk a lot about things like democracy and equality but it's not like anybody's a fan of hierarchy really except for people that are on the top and are like maniacs like people don't practice 
hierarchical relationships in their lives because they're fans of hierarchy. It's just the only thing, it's the only thing they have access to on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of time to practice it. We practice it at work, you know, and then we carry it with us to like interpersonal relationships. We carry it with us to our like fantasies about what like heroism looks like in superhero movies and stuff like, you know, it, it's all around us. So competition could mean very immediately just like, okay, well, you've got a bad job that you don't like. Let's create better jobs for people. And let's make those jobs places where people can practice things like democracy, things like equality, things like governance, things like caring for each other. Like we, we need to have spaces to practice that. Like, and I think this is a, one of the big misunderstandings about like what I would call like revolutionary movements is that revolutionary movements kind of expect that everybody knows how to be democratic, that everybody knows how to be mm -hmm. equal, that everybody knows how to make decisions collaboratively. But we have so little practice doing that especially doing it in like a consistent, structured, you know, reproducible way, as you might find in the cooperative movement through over like a hundred years now, they've been practicing specific techniques, like reproducible techniques, like ways to play together for collaboration. But, you know, are anarchists doing that? Are political radicals doing that? Like generally, no, like they're not actually practicing those things in their day-to-day -day lives. They might know a lot about the ideas, like in a kind of abstract sense, but they don't know how to like actually kick the ball. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, this comes down to a personal thing is that, you know, I don't want to spend my life just talking about the things that I'm against, the things that I think are bad about the world. Obviously, we need to expose those things. Obviously, we need to point out how destructive, you know, the hierarchical relationships. Yeah in our lives are and to demonstrate that you know there are clear demonstrable examples in society that when people are put in situations of you know relative like economic equality that it ends up being better for everyone's like mental health or emotional health these are things that we can easily demonstrate mm -hmm. but i want to practice i want to play <laughs> i want to be a part of all of this stuff yeah yeah i mean i could talk on and on about this for for a while trying to state it the best way but simply, simply put is that we need to create and practice better games for people to play together. We need to design new games for people to play together, new ways of living together, new kinds of businesses that are run democratically. And those should be games that other people can learn and that they can practice playing themselves. Definitely. I really like that. I don't want to pick apart everything that you said there, but I do want to touch a little on the reasons why I think that framing and this idea is useful and important. And two things that I can think of right off the bat is one, it gets around the problem of evangelism. And two, this kind of approach and outlook in general doesn't rely on sort of the good nature of humans in order for it to work. Right? It gets around evangelism because you don't have to convince someone of freedom in order for them to experience it. Like you only need to sell it to them or show them how it happens, right? And also the competitive approach doesn't rely on everyone becoming angels either. See, for me, like this kind of thing, it seems obvious that it could work, for instance, like with self-interest and incentives alone. Like those things alone are enough, it seems to me. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but those are two things I immediately take from that that I see as important and highlight how practical and useful that concept is. Yeah, I definitely feel in a similar vein. You know, there's a lot of different ists and isms out there, you know, whether they're socialists or capitalists or anarchists or liberals. And there's a lot of different perspectives out there. And one of the strange things that I think ends up happening is that people who are very dedicated to their ideas, that believe that their ideas are true, that believe that those ideas could help other people, there's this kind of strange mental thing that happens, especially in a situation where you don't have the ability to start actually practicing those things. Like if you're an advocate for democracy, but you don't actually have spaces in your everyday life to practice democracy, like 
in a business or with your friends on a project or something, then it kind of reverts into this weird space where rather than creating spaces together where you can practice and learn and experiment and ultimately experience what it's like to do something like democracy in an immediate direct democratic way, instead your goal is just to like make everyone a Democrat or something. Your goal is to, you know, oh, I don't have any place in my everyday life to like do anarchism. So I guess the only thing I can do is try to make everybody an anarchist. So it gets totally focused on just like this realm of ideas. And it's so focused on just like converting people. So everybody's arguing over like, what's the right thing to convert to? And weirdly, very few of those people that are fanatical about attaining converts to their particular perspective, they're not really creating spaces for those people to actually experience the ideas. They're just trying to get them to like accept them in some abstract way. But we're never going to create, we're never going to create a world where everybody commits to the same idea. You know, if anarchism has something to say that's unique in this realm, I think that we have perhaps the clearest uh, mental path forward to how do we create a world where people can practice ways of being equals and ways of being free and ways of providing for each other's needs, mm -hmm. you know, organizations that do that without everybody having to make some sort of like ideological shift mm -hmm. without everybody having to like, you know, all agree upon something, you know, it's not as if everybody who doesn't accept some label for themselves is just like an average person or like a normal person your normal person is like a passionate person who's living out their life to the fullest and trying to achieve their goals. You know, where alternatively, many of the people that spend all their time like arguing about politics are just kind of like fanatics who are willing to sacrifice their own well-being on an everyday basis for some cause. Sensible, passionate people living in the world aren't going to sacrifice that. And I think they are they have the right position. You know, that's something that everybody needs to learn from. And that's why I'm so interested in in like the cooperatives movement, for example, the cooperatives movement provides these kinds of opportunities for people. It provides like democracy and resources and good jobs and like honorable, good lifestyle for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something, something that's more dignified at least. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, what are like political radicals on the internet offering, you know, passionate people to do other than just become a political radical themselves? They're not really doing, they're not providing them anything. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I get frustrated often when I'm, say I do fall into sort of that evangelical or antagonistic approach. I sometimes get pushback from people who are like, anarchism seems great, but I just don't think we're there yet. You know, we aren't ready. And they, like some anarchists do, sort of lean into this idea that we need to become angels in order to live in a free world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I guess to reiterate what you're saying is like if you give someone the ability to be free, they don't need to be convinced that freedom makes sense. You only need to give them the tools. I got one more question for you, Hakanto, and then I'd like to move on to some other topics. And I'd also like to get Steven's perspective on some of this stuff. Can you think of any actually existing examples of a competitive approach or alternative that's worth pointing out? The clearest ones right away are just existing models in the world where people either run companies or organizations or institutions democratically and where the people who are the everyday like working participants in those organizations are also people that they have a democratic say in that organization and they have like ownership stake in it. That already exists and it exists not on a small scale. Like I, I've been really avidly studying this stuff lately. And although there's certainly not many cooperatives that you run into on an everyday basis here in you know the United States, you know, cooperatives are a like massive economic force in other parts of the world. There is a, uh, if I'm getting all my information right, there is a fertilizer company in India that is a, it's not a worker cooperative, but it's like a, I think a producer cooperative or a consumer cooperative. And it controls like 35% of the entire fertilizer market of India. It's a federation of like thousands and thousands of other cooperatives. So it's not so much that these things are something that we have to create. 
it's not so much that like, all right, political fanatics, time to go to the drawing board and like design a perfect world. It's more just about plugging in. It's more about accepting almost that there's people out there that are like already doing a lot of this stuff. And to them, you know, sometimes it's still going to be political, but it's not so much about like the political terminology for them. You know, people are participating in, you know, in Emilia Romagna in northern Spain, something like a third of the entire economy is cooperatives, many of them worker cooperatives, you know, in I think like 5% of, I can't remember the exact number, but just suffice it to say, there's like significant, significant parts of the economy that are democratically run, and where like the everyday working people have like a stake in what's going on. So if we can simply create if we can create institutions like that, or, you know, maybe kind of somebody just needs to get off their high horse and join something that already exists, you know, and start participating, start participating in, you know, the economic democracy, which is already a very powerful force in the world, and try to find more ways for the different kinds of cooperatives, I'd say, especially worker cooperatives, to be able to creatively reinvest in the founding of more cooperatives, which seems to be one of the major, one of the problems that cooperatives face is that they don't really get like outside financing in the same way that shareholders can buy stake in like a capitalist firm like they don't run like that because obviously you want the workers to have ownership you want them to have stake if it's a consumer cooperative you want the consumers to own it if it's a producer cooperative you want the producers to own it but there are creative models where it will be easier to found these kinds of institutions so that's something that you know before taking this cooperative course that i've been taking I didn't know anything about those opportunities that existed. And I think it's part of the futility, perhaps, of the political approach or the just like the theoretical political approach that I could study a variety of different political positions, you know, and kind of economic philosophy positions for years while trying to find my foothold in the world about what's true and really not encounter any of that information, especially in a practical sense where you're like, oh, this is a business that does this. This is a company that does this. This is a group that does this. Like you could go years and years and years without even being able to name a single example. To conclude a big part of this uh, like antagonism versus competition thing is that antagonism is a vibe like going out into the world and being like capitalism is evil you know the united states is evil or like whatever like whether you believe it or whether you don't whether you think it's evil or whether you don't if you find people that agree with your positions and you're presenting them that way you're going to find other people that are antagonistic they're going to be the people who are attracted to that plot line, to that like story, you know, and, and we see this in like a lot of movies and stuff, you know, be like, we are the heroes and there are evil people out there and we need to defeat the evil people. And well, what happens in most of those movies? Nothing. They defeat the evil people and then the movie ends. You don't see the world afterwards. You never see the people <laughs> like you, you never. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're like intoxicated by that simple narrative. Yeah, and that's because like, you know, it's if if somebody believes that they are the hero and that everybody else out there is just kind of like the deluded masses or some nonsense like that, you know, or if they're used to like a video game where they're the hero running around and everybody else in the world is just some NPC that has no clue that like the evil, you know, lord is about to defeat everybody or something. Like <laughs> If that's the story that you're so used to living out, then how on earth are you going to be prepared or ready, even like personally and emotionally, for collaborating with other people as equals? Like, especially in like a democratic space, like you're not, you're going to be living out this kind of like antagonistic heroism plot line. You're not really going to have any concept of what the world looks like once the enemy is defeated. And all the people out there, all the like real passionate people, who aren't fans of like hierarchy. They're just <laughs> not many people are fans of hierarchy. Like anarchists don't have to convince people of that. They aren't really given a space in the story. And it's not political radicals job to make a space for them in the story. It's their job to collaborate with them to like get off this like heroism binge and you know, not try to create roles for people, but try to create games, if, if anything, that people can play together. If they have an idea of what that game looks like, then create that, let people participate. But otherwise, it's just going to 
I feel like so many of these things and even like radical politics in general, I feel like they uh, uh, like sadly, they they basically just drive passionate people away. You're left with like self-sacrificial fanatical people and uh eventually the only people left are just going to be fanatics who you know aren't self-serving enough to want to build that kind of like democratic institution together collaboratively i tell you what Stephen, why don't why don't we go ahead and get your take on this i don't know if you feel that the show that you're going to do is sort of ideologically motivated by the ideas that we're just talking about but what's your whole take on this competition versus antagonism and do you see it as related in any way to sort of what you're trying to do with the new show yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we get so it's generally caught up in kind of discussing, you know, these these things that have been relegated to the world of politics as political things, when really the, they're not political things. They're just normal, you know, realities of life that have been made political. And what I'm talking about is school, is work, is, you know, your social institutions, all of these kind of standard social protocols that have been co-opted by the state. Um, and not just the American state or any other individual state, right? But the idea of this state, the idea of, um, of you know, some divinely righted institution that is allowed to kind of, you know, meter out violence and justice. So I may be a little a little less harsh than than Akanto. I think that there's a place for antagonism. There's a place for this competition. I think a lot of people fall into antagonism because when you're looking at kind of, you know, taking the experience of the average American, someone that's thrown into, you know, the public education system at the age of five or so, there's not really all those alternatives. And in a lot of places, continuing with the discussion of education as our example, in a lot of places, school choice and the opportunity to seek out, you know, alternative educational institutions is limited by the state. And so at that time, even if you were to create an alternative, that alternative would also be antagonistic. Mm -hmm. So I do agree. I think I, I largely agree with the broad strokes. You know, I want to be more focused on creating alternatives, on focusing on the brass tacks and the hard details of how we go about actually structuring those things and the technical aspects of creating these alternatives. Um, but at the same time, I think you really can't have one without the other. Um, now, we do have a ton of alternatives. Hakanto was talking about the you know, various cooperatives in uh, India and in Spain. We also have a, not just strictly cooperatives, but just better ways of doing business. You know, there's holacracy and other methods that have been pretty largely adopted by the tech industry here in the U.S. and globally. And there's other methods which may even be less radical, which are gaining momentum. So I think Hakanto is absolutely right. We need to kind of find where we can make a difference in reality and seize those opportunities where they are. And for some of us living in certain places, we're gonna have access to a lot more business opportunities, educational opportunities, social uh, institutions that are cooperatively owned or managed or operated or what have you. In the US, we may have to create a lot more of those alternatives and those opportunities ourselves, but there's still a lot to tap into. You know, We do have large cooperatives here in the US as well, REI, is a outdoor gear company that's a, uh, a customer cooperative they absolutely dominate the industry you know so we don't we don't necessarily have all the examples that you'll find globally but we do have quite a few in what arena or industry do you think we need to see these competitive alternatives most like you were mentioning, the state clouds out the ability for grassroots solutions to human problems, right? So when we think of arbitration, we think of courts because largely the, the state has a monopoly on that. Can you think of any of these areas that you think a competitive alternative is most important in and especially maybe right now? You know what I mean? I, I do. You know, I have, a, I have a ton of thoughts on those. I know Hakanto and I have talked about this in the past as well, and I think we both really recognize and respect the individual needs of individual communities. There's mm -hmm. a lot to be said for, you know, the, the simple failure of our systems may not even be necessarily in the awful ways they're organized, but just the scope of them. You know, just look at this awful bailout. I don't even want to go into the ridiculous details of it all, but let's just pretend that somehow $1,200 to the American taxpayer was a reasonable reasonable compensation for this, this federal <laughs> shutdown. Um, that goes a lot further in Kansas than it does in Texas or than it mm -hmm. does in 
Florida or New York, right? We live in very different realities and our institutions need to be able to reflect those differences. I think the biggest places we can make a difference immediately are in the places that we individually come in contact with the most. So, you know, if you work at a small company, do what you can to modify uh, that small company, do what you can to kind of change the way that that company's run and operated on a daily basis. There's lots of great reasons to do it, not just for the, you know, the quote unquote worker, but solving these inefficiencies and in information flows are generally highly beneficial to the, to the business itself. So I think engaging in the places that, that we are engaged in most and altering them to be more cooperative, to be more egalitarian is, is the way to go. But if I have to look at it from a kind of movement perspective, if we were to whiteboard this and kind of plan out what targets were going to be, you know, there's tons of different metrics, I guess, that you could establish to figure out what you would want to address first. But just off the top of my head, the basic necessities, you know, food, water, shelter, energy, mm -hmm. um, and then some of the really important stuff like education, going back to education, you know, what we're experiencing right now, um, the kind of blossoming of the internet into this thing that's so ubiquitous that we have this massive problem with what we're now calling fake news, really just demonstrates that a lot of people are not, a lot of grown ass people are not prepared to deal with data, to deal with facts, to deal with sussing through various narratives to figure out what you know, is most likely what is most truthful. A lot of people are really, really, really bad at it. And how can we expect to kind of build a better world if we can't even process information in a way that that makes a whole lot of sense? So I really think diversifying education, developing more community, more educational institutions that reflect the makeup and the needs of those communities is definitely going to be one of the biggest bangs for the buck. Yeah, I think I, I think I see what you're saying there, Stephen. It you're kind of bridging the competitive alternative idea to the flow of information and taking a competitive approach towards antagonism and saying, hey, here's here's a way to help people get correct information in a sea of fake news or something. Mm, yeah. Is that what you're saying, Stephen, sort of? Yeah, I mean I think that's an important need to fill. You know, I do. But more more specifically, what I was trying to communicate was that if I was the one making the decisions on, you know, where we are going to make these institutional changes to more uh, more cooperatively owned and managed and operated institutions, I would say you know, first engage and kind of modify the institutions that you are most engaged with on a regular basis. So that's probably going to be your, you know, your peer group, your coworkers your um, social institutions, if you if you have any, you know, social institutions that you participate in, and, and your job, those are going to be the big ones. Um, if you have a religious institution, that's probably another big one, where you, you can work there to make those things more cooperative. But if I'm looking at it, you know, from a different perspective, if I'm looking at it more as an activist, I would point out, we need to really build a much more robust local economy, in the basic human necessities, like food, water, shelter, energy, those sorts of things. And we also really need to focus on improving the educational opportunities that we're offering our younger people in society. And what I'm trying to communicate is if we look around now, what we see is so many people are so thoroughly confused and you really can't blame them. There is a lot of misinformation out there, but it just, just does go to demonstrate how wo woefully inadequate the state education system's been. So that's me being antagonistic. But now being you know creative and, and solution oriented, we need to establish those alternatives. And in a lot of places that's going to re you know require establishing those educational alternatives is going to require a little bit of antagonism and a little bit of that creation and a whole lot of that creation as well, because you're going to actually have to overturn a lot of law. And, you know, if we look at land use and we look at zoning and things like that, too, you can absolutely go and, and build yourself a mixed use, you know, five story structure somewhere and uh, and get away with it. But it's not legal most places outside of Houston. So you're going to run up against through that act of creation, you're going to run up against some sort of legislative legal state barrier that's going to have to be overcome. Now, a lot of people on small scales can generally skate by, but the bigger scale that you do it, the more difficult that it is. I hope that clarifies. Yeah, it definitely does. 
And what area are you most excited about seeing a competitive alternative to? One of the things that I noticed when I was taking this uh, economic democracy class on edX, speaking of education, it's pretty incredible that edX, I'm pretty confident, is not you know, a democratically owned, like, you know, cooperative organization. But nevertheless, it was incredible to see that on this course, many of the other people that were participating were from all over the world. So you could see that that even on an online course for something like this, that there's not only interest from people from many different continents and many different backgrounds, but that they also have access to it, which is incredible. <clears throat> One of the things that came up in the class that seemed very important was uh, like community renewables and creating energy there and especially having communities own and manage renewable energy resources. You know, these, these communities that are working on these projects together not only build, you know, more of a sense of connection, mm -hmm. but they get a very immediate payback from their work. Some of them, you know, the investment from the community for establishing something like, you know, hydroelectric or something, these things don't pay them back immediately. But then in the long run, these can be things where they can put a lot of money into the community. Um, the community has the experience of democratically running and owning an organization like this. And even more interesting is that uh, I'll actually throw a few links out there that I found. One of these is energy for all. That's like the number four uh, dot co dot UK. And energy for all is a, like a green cooperative energy company in uh, the UK. And they've got 27 different independent renewable energy companies that are like combined in that. Their cooperatives have 16, nearly 17,000 individual members who own these different renewable energy cooperatives. So this is something that's just like so immediate and so obvious because everybody needs energy, whatever you're doing. I've worked in coffee for a long time and done and like instructed people for espresso. So my first thought might be, hey, like, I know how to do that. I can start a cooperative coffee shop or something and find people that are interested in that. And maybe I'll still do that anyway. But if you do something like energy, if it's community owned and managed, it gives an immediate way for the community to be producing something that everybody needs. And it gets reinvested back into the community, back into the creation of more cooperatively owned companies. And community members as individuals can invest in these, which is also uh, fascinating. There was another group called Abundance Investment, which I believe is another uh, group in the UK. They've invested 102 million pounds into 42 projects successfully funded and all different kinds of community owned projects like this. And people are getting, you know, people are making money off of this on like a community level. So th things like this. Yeah, these aren't small numbers, I think is the thing that I want to stress. I'll kind of backtrack a little bit. I think one thing that we don't focus on enough is the idea of essentially creating institution as kind of a bad tone. A lot of a lot of people don't like the word institution, but if we're trying to create something that isn't strictly about the individuals involved, you know, if we want to create, you know, a project that has like longevity, if we want to create an organization that has longevity that continues to provide benefits for people on into the future, then we need to find ways to invest in and create those organizations. You know, here in Houston, I have a lot of interest in finding more ways for people to collaborate and learn about creating cooperatives because I want to participate in one. But it would be a very damaging route for me and for the intelligence and creativity of that organization for me to not establish an actual democratically owned and owned is complicated, but Creating a democratically like run organization, hard to own it because I mean, the organization doesn't own anything yet. So, but if we're going to create something like that, the goal is to like design the organization to get feedback on that. There's tons of different cooperative groups to give uh, like feedback on those designs essentially. But then to like, you're trying to found this group, you're trying to found this institution. If you, and if you refuse to found the institution, then in a way you're kind of tethering it to yourself. Like other people are not going to be able to get involved to the same degree if I don't create an actual organization that's democratically controlled. If I just say like, hey, I'm advocating for this, but ultimately at the end of the day, this is just my thing. and I'm going to, you know, do whatever I want and you'll help <laughs> out, but you don't really have any say, you know, 
there's a lot of projects that are founded by people that are supposedly like advocates of equality and collaboration and cooperation and stuff. There's a lot of projects out there, especially in like political groups, I think, that they think that you can just get a group of people together and the person that has the most social capital or has invested a bunch into its founding won't permanently stay the kind of heroic overseer of the group. Well, yeah, so like that governance and spelling out that governance is important in order to help avoid those situations is what you're saying. Yeah, and cooperatives are very explicit about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of hesitancy, I think, in people that in the very people who are coming at these things from a political angle, I think there's a lot of hesitancy to found an actual organization, like an actual institution that, that governs itself. If you don't co-create this institution that governs itself and that empowers its participants to engage with that governance process, then it will be informally and socially governed by whoever is involved that has the most influence or has the most say. And ultimately, the organization will suffer a lot from that. Because one of the things that I think is so incredible about conventional businesses, this is the last thing I'll say on this, and, and it was already remarked on earlier by one of y'all, is that Conventional businesses are terrible at getting the most out of the people participating in the business. Mm -hmm. They're terrible at it. Like we act like capitalism is so incredibly efficient and that it like gets the most out of all of its employees. But most employees are constantly presented with reasons to not invest everything they have in a business, especially on a small business level. Like small businesses, you don't have to try to convince you that you're like family or something so that you'll overcommit to it because they can't convince you on the level of it just being a job. <laughs> like, so that's what I'm getting to is that there is a unique opportunity in a democratically controlled and run structure where its members really do have a say in how it runs. There's an opportunity to actually get the most out of the people collaborating. And those people generally aren't offered that experience by capitalism at all. They are not given a space to be heard. They are not given rights of participation. They are not given ownership. These are all essentially the products that a freer world can offer them. And they're products that capitalism will never offer them. And, and the thing is, we can only provide those products, those experiences, I think, if we create actual organizations. If you don't create the organizations, then those people's rights to participate, their rights to own the organizations and benefit from them, they won't they won't really have that connection. It'll just kind of be empty promise. Right. And how would your average wage worker or just average person who's interested in these ideas or interested in a more dignified workplace, how would they tap into something like that? It was genuinely a little bit tricky to just get plugged into the resources that already exist. But there's very, very good news I have. Cooperatives around the world are very, very dedicated to providing you with resources. Yeah. There are tons of resources out there. Even just the other day, because one of, my, uh, one of my friends has been hearing that I've been putting this work into studying cooperatives and trying to learn more about it, they hit me up and said, what would like a cooperative look like that provides medical care? You know, they're like, what would, what would that look like? And to them, because, you know, the United States doesn't have a massive cooperative sector, it's bigger than many people think, but it's not massive. To him, it was like he was inventing the idea. He'd never even, you know, he doesn't know anything about what that looks like. You know, a few searches later, there is a 248 page long report by a group in Europe called, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it because it could be like pronounced a few different ways. It's a E-U-R-I-C-S-E -E dot E-U. And this group, they had created this entire, extremely, extraordinarily detailed analysis of cooperative contributions to medical care in the, in the world. You know, 250 page long analysis. So the question isn't, are these things out there? The question isn't, oh, I guess I have to build this all from scratch. You know, in the spirit of cooperatives, it's really about learning and finding who to ask for help. And there's a lot of groups out there that are very willing to offer help. Some of the immediate ones right away, the United States Federation of Worker Cooperatives. If you were to look them up, they do webinars, sometimes multiple webinars a month on different topics about like pay equity once a month. At the beginning of every month, they do a webinar for how to start up a worker cooperative. I participated in that this month, and I thought it was 
very high quality. There's other groups that do education. You could look up the School for Democratic Management. That's democraticmanagement.org. I won't make a long, long list, but uh, uk.coop. I, I have a, send him the link when you're done. He's got binders of this stuff. And yeah. <laughs> he's been kind of downplaying the amount that he's researched this previous to recently, but Hakanto has been into this stuff for years. I mean, it was our first conversation back in like, what Hakanto, like 2014, we were talking about cooperatives. Um, yeah. And, and one thing that I have, uh, that I need to give myself some credit for that I have been very good at is during the time that I've been studying cooperatives and trying to learn about it, every single time I find a useful resource, I am saving information from it and categorizing it. So there are tons of things that I have saved. We could even make a list or something and put it on non-servium for people to look up. That would be great. Because genuinely, this has been the most frustrating part is just not knowing how to get plugged into this stuff when so much of it exists. Just an incredible amount of information exists. But yeah, usworker.coop is a great place to start. Institute.coop, that is the Democracy at Work. Institute. They have tons of different resources. One of the most interesting resources they have is they did a state of the cooperative sector for worker cooperatives uh, in 2019. And that report produced some really in interesting, really beneficial information. Because yeah, this is the stuff that people in the US simply don't know, which is uh, that the entry level wages at all the worker cooperatives that reported across the US that were interviewed by the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, the average entry level wage was 1967. So it's an entry level wage. Wow. Now that's better than a lot of people's like top pay if they're working at service workers ever. Not even just service workers, you know, city employees across the US would be happy to make that. Oh yeah, and, and it goes so much further than that because that's just their wage. If the businesses are successful, keep in mind these, these employees are the member owners of the business, they're the worker owners. So they often receive patronage. The worker co-ops will distribute surplus to the members depending on how successful the cooperative has been. And the average patronage for worker owners across the U.S. was $8,200 a year. Well, there you go. That's that competitive advantage. Oh. So, it's an, so on top of that 1967 an hour, a su successful cooperatives that were distributing patronage, you got an additional check of eight grand a year. And yeah, that was a detailed study where it was, oh, I've got to pull up that one as well. So I mean, break down eight grand for someone that's making $19 an hour, right? That's 400 labor hours. Right. <laughs> so well, you know yeah. that's 10 weeks that's one fifth of your entire work year that's just incredible that you're getting, yeah, you're no, getting a income. yeah that's an incredible amount of money and for the for the successful cooperatives it goes even further than that there is a cooperative in berkeley called the cheese board which is part of a group of, I believe, seven, eight member businesses called the Aris Mendy Association. Six cooperative bakeries, a landscape design building cooperative, and a development and support cooperative. And then the Aris Mendy Association provides accounting, legal, and educational services for all the cooperatives in the organization. But the people that work at um, the Cheese Board, which is one of those companies, they make at least by the last numbers. So this is on top of the numbers we're already talking about. Four weeks paid time off each year. They have health insurance. They collectively purchased like a country cabin that you can go vacation at. <laughs> so the idea that I'm not trying to get into everybody's heads because it's not true. It's not true that every cooperative is like a guaranteed success where you're going to make a ton of money or something. Right, right. In fact, cooperatives where people make too much money actually generally... Um, suffer from a problem called degeneration, where the owners of the cooperative kind of start realizing that they can hire outside people to work for less money, and it slowly degenerates into a into essentially a, a typical capitalist firm. It seems that seems like easily, easily uh, restricted by a bylaw. Yeah, yeah, it's the kind of it's the kind of thing where um, I, I think ideally many cooperatives would put a cap on those kinds of numbers, and then they would reinvest that money back into other the founding of other cooperatives in the community or into other projects. 
there's nothing saying they have to do that. But the cooperatives that are most successful in the long term, and remember, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about founding mm -hmm. institutions. We're like trying to build a ship together and the ship is going to sail forever. You know, <laughs> we're trying to build these uh, these vessels that can like carry people and the health of their lives and be run by them, be sailed by them, be directed by them. We're trying to found these ships that people will sail together. And the most successful cooperatives are the ones that are like federated together and provide services and help to each other. Those are the ones that have the best long-term prospects. This is cooperatives that have been around for a long time, like an Italian cooperative that's been around for like 140 years. Like this isn't a new idea. A lot of the densest neighborhoods in, in Europe are all like cooperatively owned buildings and stuff need to like pull my citations for this right but i remember you know a lot of these super dense neighborhoods outside of paris I mean, just absolutely beautiful super walkable vibrant communities were all cooperatively managed and usually the buildings were also cooperatively managed so it's just yeah. like very cool very traditional in a lot of places you were talking about it earlier Hikanto. we don't really need to reinvent the wheel right a lot of this information is out there it's just about kind of finding it, figuring out what works best for any person's given context, right? Yeah. And, and having the, in some cases, for people who've been, who feel like they've been studying politics for a long time and they know a lot about it, um, it's about taking a step back. It's about taking a step toward humility. You know, when people feel like they know a lot about the world, take a step back and become a good listener, like ask for help. These organizations and these different groups of advisors, these organizations that have existed and have been experimenting with, you know, democratic governance and ownership and investment. These groups want to help either for hire or generally like for free. And it's really about going out and finding them and asking for help. U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives is a great place to start. The Sustainable Economies Law Center, another great place to start. If you want to get really into legal stuff, there's cooplaw.org with a hyphen in between the two O's of co-op. But yeah, just tons of stuff out there to help people out and get them connected. We've been talking about cooperatives this entire time, but what the hell is a cooperative? How does it actually function? So the most essential thing about a cooperative, as opposed to like a conventional business, is to know that there are different kinds of cooperatives. We can't define the question universally and just say like, this is what it means. And all cooperatives that you find are gonna look exactly like this. That's not the case, but there are things that cooperatives all have in common. The main thing that cooperatives have in common is that they are exclusive in a sense that the people that are members of the cooperative are the owners of the cooperative and they are expected to be working members at the cooperative and that's in the case of like a, a worker co-op. So a co-op will specify that if you want to be at a worker cooperative, if you want to be a member owner, you have to be actively working at the business. If you cease working at the business, you cannot remain an owner. There's no outside ownership in a cooperative model. That also means that cooperatives don't have outside investment in the same way. They'll be kind of self-funded by the member owners of the cooperative that get together and create the model and then they run it democratically. There's other cooperative models where they'll be kind of funded by the community. So it might be like there's a $300 share where you buy a share of the business and then you are part of this cooperative. Cooperatives that run like that will often, they'll have a little bit different like management model where the community members that own the business, let's say it's like 3,000 people, they will elect a board of directors that kind of like oversees the cooperative's goals and keeps it on track. That board of directors might choose certain managers, and then those managers will hire people from among the membership to like work on the everyday affairs of business. But in the worker cooperative model, it's generally a little bit less uh, like structured than that, or things might be run by like committees. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that like being a member of a cooperative gives you certain rights in relation to the cooperative and it get, it puts responsibilities upon you to the cooperative, especially in the case of like a worker cooperative. Like you can't be a member and own it and not be expected to contribute to it with your work. The other distinction that's really important is that no member can have more than one share of ownership. So it's one member, one share, one vote. 
Whereas in like a capitalist firm, you could own one person could own like 40% of all of the shares and then other outside external shareholders or investors own other shares. And, you know, whoever owns the most shares gets more votes. In a cooperative, you cannot buy more votes. You only get one vote for being one human being. And that is that right there is like the firmest distinction is that you can only own one share and consequently have one vote towards matters of governance for the cooperative. But the specific way that each cooperative decides to be governed uh, may be very different from cooperative to cooperative. They'll try things out and do their own styles for what's appropriate for their needs. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and move towards the end of our conversation? I do have some more questions for both of you. As we exit, I want to I want to ask you, Stephen, we've talked a lot about cooperatives, but with your new show, what else do you plan to explore in general? Well, Joel, that's a great question. Um, you know, really, the listeners just going to have to tune in to episode one to find out. <laughs> I actually like that suspense. I'm interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> We'll say this much. It's certainly an experiment that's informed by our current predicament that we find ourselves in. You know, I think people, a lot of people, a lot of normal people out there are looking around and feeling like they've been failed by their social institutions, their corporate institutions, and their their state institutions all at the same time, and all in concert, right? So I think this is a great time to kind of delve into what we can do about that. Mm -hmm. to build ourselves systems that are much more resilient, much more humane going forward. Hell yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to that. And, you know, now is a good time better than ever to start thinking about how to build a new economy within the shell of the old. So I'm definitely looking forward to your first episode as well as the episodes to come after that. Just to transition back, as many of you may know, if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you may have noticed a theme, and that is where I ask each of my guests, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Mm. And um, it just so happens that Hakanto is actually the inspiration for that question. Our mutual friend Clay is the person who always recommends it, but he got the idea from Hakanto. So Hakanto, I got to ask you, why is this question so important to you? And uh, what have you done with it? I know you have a Facebook group and other things. Um, kind of explain <laughs> uh, the inspiration behind that. So Clay and I, we were very interested because you'll see, you'll see people talk a lot about this thing that's out there, this idea called the revolution. And there's this idea that like this event is going to happen. First of all, like event based politics, I think is a bad move. You don't want event, <laughs> you don't want event based politics. You're like, oh yeah, we'll just arrive at this moment. And yeah. then after that event, everything will be like fine. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's like a ridiculous kind of assumption here that that I've experienced in my life where people that are advocates for this kind of like event based transformation of the world, they all kind of no concept and no imagination mm -hmm. about how the world would actually be different after the event versus before the event. Totally. I mean, it, that's that's a, like absolutely religious way of thinking, too. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah that we will just die and then you're in heaven, I guess. Like the idea that we don't even have to be creative about designing or imagining or articulating what the world will look like after the event is one of the reasons why I'm basically just not interested in like this idea of a revolution. Like it's just not very like it's not very meaningful to me. In part because very few people have articulated what it would mean to be post the revolution. Mm -hmm. So that we wanted to just raise this question of like explicitly, like what's an everyday event like that you do now, but after this fantastical event happens that you imagine would happen of like, now we're in your political utopia. Yeah. And I created the cappuccino question in some ways, sardonically, just to see how how completely like empty of creativity, many of the answers would be where somebody's just like, I'd have more time to play bass and I, I, you know, like I'll just get to hang out with my friends more. And you're like, so wait, are you going to be like still working at Target? Like what is, is it going to be? Like, is it gonna be? And, uh, 
Look, I, I gotta come clean with you. Don't see it as a bad thing at all as like an, a political end goal to fucking maximize chilling, dude. No, no. I mean, we don't... <laughs> My my talk about all this my talk about all this like cooperative stuff and about you know people having good work. It's not because I'm idealizing work as some sort of end in itself. It's more that in the spirit of what Stephen was saying, like we just have to find ways to provide for our needs. Yeah, we're we're all going to need things. We probably need to have a lot less of our wealth that we produce like siphoned off to like random financial companies and stuff that have nothing to do with our communities and our well-being like or just wealth extracted so that somebody can so that the owner of your business can waste a bunch of money on irrelevant stuff but yeah the cappuccino question was just an exercise in what clay and i have like playfully called explicitism it's like how can we just talk about what it's going to look like like tell me about what it's like to go get a cappuccino so I guess for me, if I were going to answer the question, which I've actually never attempted to answer because I've mostly put myself in the position of, of asking others as, a, as kind of a... Are you going to deny me the privilege of actually asking it to you? I mean, come on. I've been waiting for this moment. Are you just going to go ahead and answer it without like allowing me... The... Live on air, folks. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's dis that's disgusting. I was just, you know, this was a this was a natural natural segue into into you asking the question. All right, Hakanto. How can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? The truth is, I don't have much of an imagined political utopia. And if I do have one, much of what it looks like is that I want a place where the people that I know and the people that I care about in my everyday life, like the real existing people right now, like my coworkers and like, you know, just other people in my life that I care about. I really value the idea of them having more of a say in the things that they're producing in their jobs. And to me, like if I wanted to get really fantastical about it, that would mean that I want people to, you know, have real stake and ownership in those jobs. I would love if there were collaborative, federated alliances and investment groups, uh, maybe like guilds in a sense, that you could turn to to create new businesses and where you could create new teams of people that are providing new products. I really like the idea of people creating work and activities or designs as being kind of open source models that we can hack and that we can adapt and that we can fork the model and change it. So I picture like, you know, a cafe where people that I care about work, but they really have the right to exercise their creativity and they have a space where they can come up with what their own values are, whether it's all aesthetic, like they just want to create a space that looks super beautiful and they want to trick it out in that way. Or maybe they've decided that their collective values are just all about like hyper efficiency. Like we want to just design a game where we can make the drinks as fast as we can and be very, very strategic about all of that. That's kind of what, like my political utopia would be a space where, where people, they really see like the things in their life, whether it's work or their home, they see those spaces as spaces that are really interactive yeah. and they kind of break down some of the barriers around whether things always have to be the same way that they like to be experimental and playful about changing those things so i can totally see a world where some people would decide to sell coffee out of like the back of an adapted truck or something like we've seen in rojava like there was a guy with a three group espresso machine people were driving up on motorcycles and he was like hand handing them drinks you know we'll see stuff like that but we'll also, if I'm going to stay realistic, which I am to an extent, I would just love to see spaces where people really got to be playful and explicit about like the game they want to play together, how they want to play it, what the rules look like, and that there's enough of these kinds of models in the world that are like collaboratively owned by people and that share their discoveries open source. But if you worked at a place and you wanted to try out something a little different, or if your community was doing something a little bit different, that they would be very, very encouraging about trying to give you kind of like blueprints that you could adjust and adapt to found a new game and a new way of doing things. Even for the cooperative project that I'm trying to get people working on in Houston, you know, I do not want it to be the only group. I think it would be even more amazing if eventually people took the concept that we worked on 
and they forked it and they like adapted it and they changed it. And maybe they had different priorities. Maybe they wanted to present the ideas of uh, the ideas in their own way with their own spin and with their own style. That's what I want to see. I want to see more games, more experimentation, and then more of a spirit of freedom about like borrowing those things from each other. Well, that's uh, that's very beautiful, Hakanto. And um, for anyone who's been asked that question before and you didn't get the same exact answer word for word, um, you've failed the shibboleth because that was the correct answer. And thank you, Hakanto, for articulating that. Wait, what do you mean it's the correct answer? <laughs> I'm totally bullshitting. <laughs> I'm like, I'm very confident that I don't have the right answer. So I know. I just, that the was... correct answer to the shibboleth. Yeah. I'm... Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I don't want to get it in a paper cup. I don't like paper cups. G give me my cappuccino in a, in a ceramic or a glass cup. I don't want a paper cup. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. There you go, folks. You heard it first from Hakanto. Glass cups, no paper cups. Steven, while we're on the subject, I got to ask you before we end the conversation, how would one get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Man, I couldn't even tell you what's in a cappuccino. <laughs> is that like Hakanto? Is that like, uh, I know I've, I've had them, right? You know, I'm not a total, total hermit, but what is that? It's just like espresso and coffee, right? <laughs> I could tell you way too much about what's in a cappuccino. Like, <laughs> down, to the, like, like down to the, down to the gram. But. You know what I like about, about a good coffee shop, a good cafe, right? Is like not having to engage with it all that much. It's great to like go and just be in a nice environment to chat with friends and stuff. And so I would say I would really like to get a cappuccino in just like the most simple of fashions, right? Very straightforward, however that may be. I'll trade you some some chicken eggs for it. <laughs> trade you some chicken eggs. There you go. Hell yeah. You got to any society that doesn't let me trade chicken eggs for a cup of joe, I don't want to I don't I don't want to be a part of it. Right. That's what I want to say. Write that down. Now, are these like are these grade A, grade double A, large, yeah. jumbo, extra large? Bruh. Large. Bruh. They better be they better be large because those are the only ones that are cross compatible. Look, I'll put it to you this way. You'd think it came out of a duck. They're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's jumbo large. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you for answering that. I, I want to ask each of you uh, one last thing. Um, Hakanto, what are some good resources other than uh, usworker.coop and everything like that, that you recommend folks should plug into in order to learn not only about cooperatives, but more about your philosophy and political philosophy in general? Probably one of the best things that you can do if you're on the old website called facebook.com. One of the best things you can do is just join groups that are advocating for cooperatives and worker cooperative efforts, because people that are involved in the cooperative movement will constantly be posting links to webinars that are going on, to like interesting resources. So you got to find a way to like plug yourself, not just into a specific resource, but into a community that's providing you with resources. So I would say go to, uh, like I'm in a group called Worker Cooperative Effort. There's a larger one called Worker Cooperatives with a hyphen between the two O's of co-ops. And also just look up cooperative businesses, um, maybe cooperative businesses that are in your in your uh, area. Follow them. Once again, if you're on Facebook, follow them, keep up with what they're doing and support them. Um, like it feels really good, you know, in the same spirit of, uh, you know, how do I get a cappuccino in this utopia? It feels really good that there's a really excellent coffee roastery called Alchemy uh, out in California. And I set up like a coffee subscription from them and i got a bag of coffee in the mail from them and like it's really good stuff so for some of these things like if there's something in your life that you need like beer or coffee there's probably a high quality co-op like already creating some of that stuff and you can get plugged into that not only as like a consumer but in a sense as like a collaborator because you're helping push forward their own mission Outside of that, I'd say the other the other uh, links that I mentioned earlier were really important. There's a, another group called Tessa Collective, T-E-S-A Collective, um, and they have a lot of resources about cooperatives. Cultivate.coop is like a big wiki of resources with lots of videos and all kinds of things on there. 
some of these websites have like maps where you can find the co-ops that exist through a US worker co-op I believe they have one but that's the main thing just get a, just get amazed at how much stuff is already out there I I went from a space where I was thinking that there were hardly no cooperatives to finding a new one every single day whether it's a media production company uh Bonfire Media is a media production company uh CHCA is like a home care cooperative Collective Tools is a cloud software company. In Houston, there's a new construction co-op called Third Ward Co-op. There's a cooperative of yoga teachers in Houston. There's bakeries. There's an artist's collective. There's so much of this stuff out there. There's the New Means TV. They're, they do like a Netflix-style service. And yeah, they, they're cooperatively uh, owned and run. So yeah, just get out there and start searching and especially look up maps and like databases of these cooperatives so that you can find new ones. And every time you see a new one, you, it just feels a little bit more possible. Every single time I find a new one, I'm like, man, this actually exists. Like you can actually do this. And many of those cooperatives, you can either contact them or they'll be, they'll be very giving. They'll be like, here's our bylaws, check it out. Like, here's how we got set up, check it out. Uh, there's a brand new podcast that was just started called More Than a Shop. And that one's pretty good. I just listened to that today. There is a really nice, uh, for anybody else who works in the coffee industry, there's a, uh, there's a podcast on that you can get through Spotify called Boss Barista. And on Boss Barista, she did a report about a worker cooperative cafe called Full Stop Station in uh, Louisville. And that was a really nice presentation. And then Fair City Fire did a presentation on Fourth Tap in Austin. So there's just so many ways to learn about these things. Just make sure to join communities, start talking to people, and don't feel like you have to start from scratch on anything. Excellent. Thank you, Hakanto. And where should folks go to find more about the political philosophy that you're interested in, Stephen? That's a great question, Joel. Give me just one second. I definitely don't want to get this URL wrong. You know, I would say the best place to go is going to be https. Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com backslash non servium media. That's N O N S E R B I A M M E D I A. There you go, folks. You heard it. You heard it here first. That's the only thing you need to know. Go there and you'll you'll understand everything. <laughs> There's a dedicated uh, dedicated button to forward your money to non servium. <laughs> Any money that you happen to come across, you can just pass it right along. Forward, it's it, on. forward it on. It goes right into your bank account and like a skipping stone, it just jumps right out into non servium. Would be a beautiful a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, uh, is there anything I forgot to ask either of you that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? Yeah, I mean, just uh, tune in. What is it going to be, Joel? Third Saturday? Third? It'll be the third week of May. Sometime third week of May. First episode of this show. Tune in to find out the name. I want to know the name. I've been waiting this whole time. We don't have a name. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, we all love to know the name, man. Yep, to be announced. So I, I've linked to a lot of different websites and stuff, and I think that's all generally pretty helpful. But sometimes you just want to like sit down and watch a video, you know? Sometimes you don't want to like go do much of reading and research. You just want to watch a video and learn some stuff. So one of the videos, I haven't actually watched it myself, although I've no, I know I've seen pieces of it. But during my economic democracy class on edX, they took snippets from a film called Can We Do It Ourselves? And you can just type that in on YouTube and find that. So other videos you could look up if you want to watch something. Once again, just go to YouTube, type in Own the Change. Uh, and then there's uh, another documentary film called The Take, which was recommended. If you go back to cultivate.coop, I know that you can find a big database of videos that they have there. But yeah, I'd say that's it. The, the books that were highly recommended there's one called Beyond the Corporation, Humanity Working. I plan on reading that. If you Google the spirit level, why equality is better for everyone, uh, it leads to a really interesting group called the Equality Trust that has studied like the social, like interpersonal impact of when societies have more democratic say and when in their own lives and when they're when they have a more socioeconomic equality, showing that they have like better physical health, better mental health, less drug abuse, better education, like 
across the board, it makes a really big impact. So you can read that at their website. And I think that's an important argument for um, the cooperative style of doing things. There's another book called Cooperatives in a Post-Growth Era by Novkovic, N-O-V-K-O-V-I-C. And then those are some of the main ones that I was seeing that looked really good. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, um, thank you all so much for joining me today. I can't thank you enough for um, the thoughtful words. I know that uh, it's, it's, it's not always easy to find the time to do these sorts of things. And I, I appreciate y'all coming on and braving this conversation with me. Thanks so much for your time. No, oh, thank you very much, Joel. Yeah, man. Thanks, fellas. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Yeah, talk to you soon, Joel. And you too, Steve. Later. And now for the bonus interview you've all been waiting for. Here's Stephen Leger interviewing Frank Muroslav. Joel has made this really sick opening and closing music for all power to the imagination. Hey, Joel, could you like put this music here? episode and i'm here with frank miroslav by the way did i pronounce that correctly yeah it's a fake name so whatever (laughs) all right well i'm here with frank miroslav so we're going to be talking to frank about his new show all power to the imagination which is going to be dropping later this month so frank first off welcome to non-servium media we're so happy to have you aboard this is going to be great yeah, um, I'm so glad I get to be a podcaster now because that's such a you know valuable profession. <laughs> it's it's definitely not oversaturated no. whatsoever. No, as <laughs> as a market anarchist, I'm really good about picking my battles. Yeah. So I think I mean you know if you're going to do something creative online, it should be a labor of love. I think we live in interesting times. I think a lot of models of the world that people have been relying on for quite some time. Obviously, like the mainstream is increasingly becoming discredited, but also like on the edges, what we're also seeing, you know quote unquote radicals kind of flail around blindly and i think we're in sort of a pivotal moment in history you know everyone thought it ended but no history's (laughs) back it's the sequel history round two yeah so i think we're in like a pivotal moment you can draw all the comparisons you want to 1848 to 1917 to 1930s whatever i think the rules are being rewritten And I think people who have enough motivation and who have the correct insights, I think they can seriously leverage things for far more than they normally would. And that's like my main motivation. I think the landscape is changing dramatically and I want to be on top of things. I want to be in front of the, you know, even the extremely online weirdos who saw things coming. I want to be in front of them, hopefully. And I think a podcast is a really good way to do it because it's informal. Or you can really get into the weeds and, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just really cool. It's great. You know, it's really, it makes conversations really accessible, you know, and mm. the podcast world is totally oversaturated. No one's going to argue that there's even a whole lot of anarchist podcasts. Um, but we actually have a pretty wide open market in, in kind of left market anarchist space or uh, just kind of general market friendly anarchism and we definitely want to be getting out there in front of the curve and providing people with kind of actionable intelligence right yeah yeah i think that's one thing that i'm really interested in is there's like i think especially with like code we saw this a lot on twitter where like twitter as a social media platform was really ahead of the curve and you had people putting together guides and you know doing real-time analysis and i think something like something like that is really valuable that's definitely something i want to get into is information processing in a networked age because we've had and I will probably do an episode on this, but, you know, we've had people talk about, you know, decentralized approaches to information processing, but there's a difference between writing about it and theorizing about it and like actually putting it into action when the stakes are high. And I think being able to do that is such an amazing force multiplier. And if you're like a small group of dedicated people who want to make an impact on the world, I think that's one way, way to go about it. 
And so I kind of want to use this platform for that. Mm. I also just want to really be open to not just left market anarchist ideas, but just a spectrum of ideas in general. Again, I think the rules are being rewritten. The ground that we're standing on is unstable. And like, I don't want this to, you know, just be inside baseball for anarchists. I'd really like to reach out to not reactionaries, but like liberals or Marxists or whoever. And I think that's that's one thing I would I would like to foster. Like, you know, it would be delightful if this podcast had an audience that, you know, included people who weren't anarchists and who were like, yeah, I might disagree with you on some foundational things, mm-hmm. but, you know, you are seriously trying to grapple with what's going on today, regardless of your beliefs, you know, you have this commitment to trying to, like, figure out what what's actually going on and what dynamics are actually driving things. And so I listen to it because of that. I If I, if I accomplish that, I'd be incredibly proud of myself. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas because things are being destabilized and things are changing and so you need that sort of openness yeah absolutely so one of the main topics that you want to talk about complexity information processing what's your background and what what kind of has attracted you to this i have a degree in it from a very mediocre second rate australian university <laughs> just to give some context so at the end of your degree you have to make a, a software product in you know a mock sort of business case and when i got around to doing that we did some fingerprint recognition thing and i was the only person who actually felt comfortable coding it and mm-hmm. everyone else just kind of sat around and like did you know like write here's like our report for this week of how we're going or you know like here's a cute little picture so yeah very mediocre so that kind of you know maybe not really like it but around the same time i came down with chronic fatigue syndrome and i didn't work for a couple years and i basically just read a lot of weird shit on the internet which honestly like was way better of an education than going to university highly recommend it (laughs) <laughs> so yeah and syndrome fun fact syndrome is basically doctor professional speak for we have no idea what's going on and so i ended up after like a couple of years of just constantly butting my head against the wall and seeing many professionals I ended up seeing this guy who he's like an integrated medicine i think and it's like you know trying to see the body as an integrated system and it took seeing this guy to figure out what was wrong with me and to actually start seeing progress. And I, I already sort of had like sort of like hippie-ish inclinations of like, oh, you know, like everything's connected, man. But it was like really, yeah, it was it was really like, like actually having to grapple with this, you know, very complex problem of my body, like not being functional that sort of inclined me towards thinking in terms of more holistic dynamic systems. And also at the same time, I was reading like Kevin Carson and William Gillis and Nassim Taleb. Nassim Taleb, is, yeah. Yeah, he's like, he's like a reactionary, but like he gets a lot of things right. And I was seeing parallels between like what they were saying and what was going wrong with my body. And then there's this article that I want to I want to do an episode on called, I think it's like, anarchism and complex systems and it was published a couple of years mm-hmm. ago and it's basically like look there's like this new field of science called complex systems and it has really obvious parallels to anarchism <laughs> and nobody's like pointed it out yet but it does sorry and then after i read that i got really into reading there's like two main institutions that are doing this sort of analysis santa fe institute and the new england complex systems institute and I just started like reading a bunch of their stuff and I was like, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and also, you know, this has obvious implications. I can draw obvious connections between this, this and my health. Yeah. And so, um, like I'm still, I'm still in the process of figuring this stuff out and kind of learning about it. So that means that you and me listener are going to go on a journey together where we will learn about it together. So that'll be fun. Yeah, absolutely. That's been how we've done it since the beginning. You know, Joel nor I are, are, Experts, we've always said we're radical voices during precarious times. You're coming along with us as we explore these ideas from our perspective as quote unquote anarchists. So even since the very beginning, we, we've never been like strictly ideological. Mm. Yeah. If you look at like any, you know, like break in history where things have changed dramatically, it's never been clean 
you know, like, oh, we're going to do things according to this ideology or, you know, a group of people who all share the same beliefs to act in some way. Like, it's always been incredibly messy and weird. And I think rather than trying to fight against that, I think you should lean into it because, you know, back in the day, you know, it was good to have multiple perspectives on things and it was good to have dissent and arguments back and forth. But especially today where things are so complex and we really are part of this connected world and you can't really go back. Yeah, there's no going back. It was useful to have that in the past, but like today it's essential. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that you're going to be diving into complexity because, yeah, and you know, I'm not up on this new complexity science. I'm super excited to get to kind of go along on that journey with you. It, you know, things aren't simple. They're very messy. And if we can understand that and figure out how to lean into that in, in a positive way you know, we're going to come out, we're going to come out ahead. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, just like, just like being like comfortable with uncertainty and, you know, like grayness and just, just the psychological sort of capacity to do that. And like, I'm speaking from personal experience of having to deal with a chronic illness, just sort of like surfing that sort of uncertainty and being comfortable with having to change things and also building up, you know, sort of like a buffer where like, even if things, you know, went wrong, like I'd still like have enough of, I don't know, a surplus of whatever to make it over the line. Yeah. Planning for the uncertainty, planning for the complexity. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's something that you've experienced and kind of, was brought to the surface by your illness. But I think for a lot of people, this is going to be understandable and relatable because we're all in this pandemic situation. It's super complex just naturally. But when you start adding all these layers of policy and bureaucracy, the levels of complexity are are just multiplied <laughs> to, to infinity and beyond. And everybody's kind of scratching their head going, I have no idea what's real. I know you shared on Twitter the other day, this great article from uh, Ribbon Farm. It was plot economics. And yeah, it was great. It was about how we've, you know, collectively lost a damn plot, right? And it starts out, for the fourth time in my adult memory, humanity has collectively visibly lost the plot at a global level. Oh. Um, and he's talking about the global narrative collapse. Yep. And I think, you know, that's that's definitely something that people are experiencing right now. Mm. And so I think what you're doing is super timely. Yeah, no, one thing I really want to do is, and I think, um, God, I could do so many episodes with him, but so like Jahed Mohammed, oh, yeah. uh, Mohammed, sorry, he's really into like embodied cognition. And I think there's like some really, really interesting things to be drawn from Oh man, I'm not going to be able to say it precisely, but there's these algorithms for like searching to find like solutions in like computer science. And you can sort of make analogies between that and the implicit like unconscious way we eight ways we do things and how when that gets disrupted, it is difficult to like find a new equilibria for like the same reason that it's hard to learn a new language is that like you're doing this thing where it comes naturally because you you sort of understand all the ways that a system can work and you have sort of these unconscious ways of dealing with all these contingencies and then when that changes you have to rebuild uh from scratch all these different ways that you handle these exceptions and these contingencies for how a thing works i'm sorry if i explained that poorly but (laughs) no i don't think you did although it sounds like it's a little above my head so i'm really looking forward to when you get to Mm. actually dive into it yeah in the coming episodes so all power to the imagination yeah what does this title signify given the context of wanting to understand complexity and, Uh. and all these topics yeah so it actually comes from during the may 68 riots the student protest it was like graffiti like scribbled on the walls when those protests were going on and i learned about it through david graber's uh book uh utopia of rules that's Mm -hmm. it 
where he's like got a bunch of stuff about like bureaucracy and imagination and it's it's very fascinating and i thought it was first of all you know it's a very pr provocative phase but second of all like again you know we're in these uncertain times our unconscious ways of doing things are being disrupted we have to find new ways and it's very difficult and imagination i feel like it represents like the spirit of trying to find new ways to do things and actually grapple with the uncertainty, you know, combine old ideas together in new ways to try and figure out, like to try and figure out what's what and to try and find a path forward. Yeah. So that's sort of what I was going for there. That's great. I love it. You prefer like the idea of imagination to um, the idea of, of hope. Like the imagination is our ability to create mm. alternative worlds in our minds that we can then yeah. bring to reality. It's so yeah. much more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing, the sort of like the left broadly, you know, is in this weird position where like, I think in some ways they have a very good analysis of things, but then in, in other ways they don't. And I think the left really discounts the notion that you would ever outthink your adversaries. Which, you know, it's really weird because in some ways they have these really insightful comments, but then, you know, like you ask them for how to actually change the world. And it's like, well, you know, just elect Bernie Sanders. You've got these really smart people, but then their solution is basically to engage in trench warfare. <laughs> you know, you're like walking into the, like this arena where the stakes are so high and it's so controlled and you can't leverage the strengths that come from not being attached to these institutions which you know and that and that's like where imagination comes in because you know like the stereotype of like you know the boring bureaucrat is a stereotype because these institutions they rely on alternatives being shut down so they can function because you know like if you had creative weirdos doing things that would destabilize them and so for them to survive, they must restrict people. And, you know, these people who support Bernie, I think, like, a lot of them are, sin are sincere and, like, you know, are really passionate. And it's a real shame that the way they approach politics is, well, we're just this passion, this sincerity, like, this imagination, like, the fact that, you know, we're young people and we know how technology works and we're, like, up against establishment types who, like, you know, like, oh, how do I download PDF, grandson? It's just, like, ah, oh, it is it is very frustrating. And, you know, if my podcast can do anything, it would be to, like, convince, you know, Bernie Sanders supporters to stop supporting Bernie Sanders and, I don't know, like try 3d printing like food or something i think that would be far more fruitful right yeah yeah let's do let's yeah. do something like way more radical yeah. and just circumvent yeah, 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 the yeah, need yeah. for this yeah stuff. and like yeah it's just very frustrating so you know that that's what i'd like to do love it love it i can't wait so i don't think we've we've nailed down the exact publication date of the first episode but it's going to be sometime in mid-may uh, then we have your second episode ready to roll mid June. And that one's going to be with Jahed Momond, who you've mentioned a couple times here already. He was also on non Serbian podcast. Oh, I forget which episode, but he's been on as well. Yeah. He was on there. Fantastic. Well, do you have anything else you wanted to, uh, to chat about, about, about the new show? I'd like to do sort of like more freeform interviews and then occasional scripted solo ones about a particular topic because I just think casual conversation is fun, but it, it also isn't as structured. So yeah, there's a bunch of texts that I'd really like to go into and uh, a lot of them are quite old. So again, we're in this period of flux and all of our sort of categories and ways of approaching the world are being destabilized. And I think a big part of that is there were choices people made during the 20th century that led to this state of affairs and it didn't need to be this way. And most people don't know what some of these choices were. And so it'd be good to revisit them. The only problem is, is I don't know if I can rope people into the, into like talking about it. And so, you know, it'd just be easier to do it by myself. That's dope. So fantastic. Well, Frank, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, you'll be able to hear my episode mid-May, guys. So look forward to that. Awesome, man. Thanks, Frank. Have a good one. Joel has made this really sick opening and closing music for all power to the imagination. Hey, Joel, could you like put this music here? Well, no, at the end of this? Yeah, that'd be really cool. Thanks, man. There it is, folks. 
I hope everyone enjoyed my conversation with Hakanto and Steven Leger, as well as Steven's interview with Frank Miroslav. Big shout out not only to everyone who listens and supports the show, but also to everyone who recently offered to lend a hand in different ways. I especially want to give a shout out to Christopher Richard Hudson Jr. for helping us out with social media, as well as Zach for offering to lend a hand with editing. Of course, Frank, we're very excited to have you on board. And last but certainly not least, to our very generous patrons. Without your support, we absolutely could not keep this show going. Thank you all so much for supporting our project, especially during these precarious times. We look forward to continuing pumping out good content for everyone to listen to. So keep an eye out for the new shows that are coming. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. If you like this project and want to see us continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviumedia. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.